Thank you so much, whether you're gathered here. Let's welcome everybody who's joining us. Great to be together online too. Well, did you have a good bank holiday weekend? Wasn't it amazing? What incredible weather we had. Karen and I had the extra special privilege of hosting family for the first time in months, that is overnight. We had them uh, together uh, over the whole weekend. We have various combinations to fit in with the, the, the rule of six. Uh, uh, three generations, soon to be four generations. <clears throat> and um, it, was just, it was just so great to be together. As usual, Karen organized the event, did a fantastic job. I was able to play my part. Now, I'm not the world's greatest chef. I'm getting a bit more into cooking, I'll have you know. Uh, but I love doing barbecues. And because of the weather, um, I did three barbecues <laughs> across the weekend. Uh, not too good on the waistline, but it, well, they, were, they were pretty good, I have to say myself. Um, and so, you know, because we're family, the rest of the family pitched in to help, did the washing up. The only member of the family who did nothing to help whatsoever was Oscar. Oscar is Emmy and Alex's very cute little puppy, and I think he's kind of making up for the fact that we're waiting for our grandchild, and so he's, he's choosing to be the centre of attention. He provided uh, entertainment all through the weekend. Anyway, we finished the weekend, we came back feeling just so grateful for both the privilege of belonging in family, but also of taking part and helping to host as well. Now, I say that, I'm very conscious that many of you either don't have close family or your experience of family is maybe less than positive. But here's the great news, and this is what we're focusing on today. All of us, every single one of us, without exception, have the privilege and the opportunity of being part of the best family ever, God's family, the house of God, the household of faith. All of us, because Jesus' blood was shed, the Son of God came to die in our place. We, the sons and daughters of God, can be together in the family of God. And it's not just for now, it's for all eternity. Absolutely fantastic. And that's what we want to focus on today, the privilege of being part of God's family. Now, I believe this is something that we need to focus on maybe more than ever. I'm sure you're aware um, that we live in a uh, very individualized Western culture. In fact, the trend has been getting more to the individual and less community and family based for decades now. And of course, one of the worst impacts of the last year of the pandemic has, it, has if anything, to increase that trend. You know, understanding why we have to do this, but all the social distancing, if we're not careful, has only further isolated many, many people. And so as we look ahead and we're going into a, a new season, hopefully uh, with the, the whole situation getting better and better and more and more easing of restrictions, I believe it's vital that we don't just, as it were, try and go back to the life we had 15 months ago, to that kind of level an experience of community, but rather, and this is the burden of this series, we want to experience a revival. Can I have an amen, please? We want to see a revival, and specifically today, we want to focus on a revival of community that, as it were, wider and deeper and stronger than we've ever known before. And so once again, we're looking back at this wonderful passage in Acts chapter 2, 42, 47. You know, the last few weeks, we've been looking at this beautiful God-centered united, generous community. And today we want to lean into this sense of their commitment to be together. Verse 46, we read, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their own homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So you use that as a bit of a frame of reference. That's what we want to kind of see, a revival of that kind of community. And if you look back at verse 42, which is like a summary statement for the rest of the passage, it says simply, they devoted themselves, amongst other things, to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. That word fellowship is koinonia, it's a rich Greek word that basically has two aspects. It's the idea of belonging and participation. And what we're going to do is um, Gallia 
is going to come up and she's going to share uh, this first part looking at the, our need to belong and then I'm going to come up and uh, take on the second part looking at our need to participate. So uh, I want to welcome Galia. She's already been introduced to us. Let's give Galia a big welcome. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you so much. It's such an honour and I'm so glad that I get to share today on our first point that we need a community to belong to. Uh, growing up, much of what I understood about community actually came from the songs. You might be familiar with them. It was You Belong With Me by Taylor Swift and We Belong Together by Mariah Carey. Uh, so it was fair to say, you'll know if you've heard those songs, I had a lot to learn about belonging. But the truth is that you and I really do need to belong. It's not a nice to have, a nice add-on extra component. It is core to who we are. It's a need that is deeply ingrained in us. And, you know, we see in Acts that belonging to a community of people revived by, filled with the Holy Spirit, produced in the members of the early church, glad and sincere hearts. And I believe today that the t same is true for us. It can be true for us. How could it not be, after all, if we're living increasingly as God designed us to, belonging in revived community? And this is deeply personal for me as well today. You know, I was first welcomed in to this community, Kingsgate Community Church, where my life has been eternally and profoundly impacted through belonging. I first came along here, was welcomed in as a young teenager, and I found a place of belonging among God's people here long before I ever believed or would have called myself a Christian even. And you know what? I knew I belonged here even then. How? Well, because I was welcomed in, I was accepted as I was, even with all my broken and, believe me, very rough around the edges parts. And I was loved here. That was amazing for me. Belonging in this community provided a context for my heart to be softened by the Holy Spirit, for seeds of faith to be sown. And it was in this community where I was first introduced to the transforming love of Jesus. It was in this community where I've been getting to know him ever since, growing in knowing him. In this community where I've received healing and freedom, where I've found life and purpose in Jesus' name. Belonging to this community has totally, eternally transformed my life. And I know that I'm not the only person in our Kingsgate family who has a story that sounds something like this. Why don't we just take a moment to thank God, wherever we are today, for the amazing, transforming power of his love at work when we belong to the community of church family. Isn't he amazing? Let's give thanks. So that was my experience of belonging. But you know, when I was at university, I actually got to spend a year studying and researching belonging further. And one of the things that I came to find in the course of that was that there is actually strong sociological evidence that belonging deeply impacts who we are at our core and how we understand ourselves. Now, what I mean by that is that you and I actually understand ourselves in relation to others. Our sense of identity is deeply impacted by where we belong. So, where we belong really matters. You know, I love how the Apostle Paul describes our identity and belonging in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Because of Jesus, the Apostle Paul says to the early church and to us today as well, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members also of his household. Isn't that amazing? We are members of his household. We belong here because in Christ, you and I, we share a bloodline. And we see reminders of this time and time and time again in the New Testament, particularly through Paul's letters to the early church fellowships. He actually repeatedly refers to people and addresses them as brothers and sisters. I remember when I was first starting out as a Christian, getting to read the Bible myself for the first time and loving it, but I used to read some of Paul's letters and I just thought to myself, whoever wrote these bits has a lot of siblings. Who on earth is this? But the truth is that Paul actually knew uh, the reality of church community. He knew we're not just a bunch of people loosely acquainted because we attend or watch the same services. No, 
Paul knew the truth that the church has the potential to be a family where we belong, a place where we have friends who feel like family because in Christ, we are no longer alienated, no longer foreigners and strangers, but citizens together and members of God's household. How many of you know that is good news for us today? Amen. So that's what we belong to as a revived community of the church. But there are also some really practical ways for how we can belong. And we've got a lot to learn from the early church in Acts chapter 2 when it comes to how we belong. I want to highlight a couple of them for us today. The first one is that we experience a belonging when we prioritise community in our time. Did you notice in Acts 2, 46, it's kind of hard to miss, isn't it? That it, ha- it says, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the early church met together every day. I don't know about you, but I, I find that deeply challenging personally in our world today, in our church today. There was regularity and rhythm to the collective worship of the early church, but it really is a radical concept for us, isn't it? Regular church attendance, don't know if you're aware of this, actually is defined usually by statisticians and people who measure these kinds of things today as around two to three times per month, maybe. So what we're seeing is that as those waves of individualism that Dave mentioned earlier have swept through society, there's actually kind of been an erosion of value that gets placed on collective worship, on gathering together, whether it be online or in person, around the truth of God's word, where now regularity just means... Oh, maybe a couple of times a month, but not the every day that we saw in Acts. We don't have to be statisticians ourselves, do we, to know. A couple of times a month is much less than the every day. But can I encourage you today? Let's remember, church always has been, it is, and it will always be. More than uh, just turning up when we feel like it or when it's the most convenient to us. Church is more than skipping through the video to the bit that we prefer or the bit that makes us feel good about ourselves. The church, as a revived community, it is a place where we live out our convictions in belonging together that all our lives are actually enriched by proximity with others in the presence of God, not as an add-on but as a core aspect of who we are and how we live. So we experience belonging when we prioritise community in our time. And we also experience belonging when we give community space in our lives. Belonging happens for us today as it did in the early church for them. They were people just as we are today. And it happens in the structured and in the spontaneous. It happened for them in the big and the small. We actually see that they experience belonging through their commitment to community life uh, in the temple courts and in their homes. I don't know about you, but um, I love how in Acts 2.46, it really highlights that they they shared their lives together. It says uh, they broke bread in their homes and ate together. As Chris shared a few weeks ago, a central aspect of life for the early church were these shared meal times, were meals. It was a core part of culture at the time, and they kind of co-opted that and built their community experience together around these times, around the dinner table, around the breakfast table, around the lunch table, and all the in-between times as well. I don't know about you, but I often find that if I'm trying to get a meal in with friends today, there's at least one group chat, maybe more, hundreds, maybe millions of messages back and forth, or at least that's what it feels like, trying to find a date, a time, a location, trying to figure out who's around, who's not around, where we can go, food allergies, all of that kind of thing. But that wasn't the case for the early church. Meals were not one of many equally weighted commitments that they made a bit of a gap for in their lives. Meals were the commitment. All of their belonging happened around the dinner table and flowed out from that place into the larger gatherings as well. So can I ask you, who are you making space to share your life with? Sometimes this can mean, can't it, that we end up feeling a little bit vulnerable, maybe putting ourselves out there to experience belonging in community with others. And it can also be a little bit vulnerable if perhaps we've tried it before and just not had a great experience. But can I encourage you today, let's go again, church. The belonging that we can experience as a result of sharing our lives with others can be truly transformational. When I think back even over the past year or so, uh, I am so grateful for the times where people in my immediate church community have given this kind of space in their lives. 
I actually lived alone during the first national lockdown before support bubbles or anything like that existed. And so I know that those kind of feelings of literal isolation and loneliness can be so real to us. And it might be that many of us are still experiencing those kinds of feelings. But can I tell you, there was something that made all the difference for me, even right in the midst of it. And it was my community, my friends from church, regularly checking up on me, seeing how I was doing. It was friends from church bringing me flowers, just to remind me there was still reason to hope, even on the hard days. It was friends from church leaving bags of my favorite sweets on my doorstep, jelly snakes, in case you're wondering. And it was friends from church bringing me a meal because I mentioned in passing that I was just really tired of looking after myself and having to do all of that. It was friends from church dropping me a text out of the blue or calling me and saying, hey, Galia, I was praying for you and here's what I sense God might be saying for you. Let me encourage you. My community, my people made space for me in their lives. And can I tell you, it made all the difference. And getting to do the same out of the overflow of what I've received is also just as much of a gift. Isn't that good news that we get to serve and belong together? One of the ways that we can experience meaningful belonging, I know many of us will have a story of this being the case for us in the life of Kingsgate, is of course through our life groups. And so I want to share with you today a story from two of our amazing Kingsgate members, Jeff and Gloria, as they uh, share with us the experience that they've had in their life group during the pandemic. So then Dave will come back and continue the message. But first, let's take a look at Jeff and Gloria's story. Well, some great input from Gallia, thank you. And just a, such a, a beautiful testimony there from Jeff and Gloria. So we need a community to belong to, but I uh, trust you picked up from uh, what we just heard that we also need a community to participate in. That's the other kind of key aspect of this word uh, koinonia, um, the sense of being involved, participating, uh, serving one another. Now, you probably know by now, um, that I love watching sport. Anyone knew that? Okay, no, no surprise there. Um, I love it when they win. I hate it when they lose. I just recovered from last weekend, can I say? Um, but seriously, what I and uh, multitudes of sports fans experience when our teams win is a great feeling. You know, it's there's something about that experience. But can I say, the experience that I as a spectator enjoy is nothing compared to what the players themselves experience. 
You see, I get the, the buzz of, you know, what, watching a match and seeing them win or, you know, Man City's case often over the last few years of getting, getting medals. They actually get the medal. They're involved. It's part of their life. And so they get the credit. They get the rewards. And it's a little bit like that when it comes to, to church family as well. You see, when it comes to Christian community, those who are the most involved ultimately are the most fulfilled. This is my experience from pastoring for 33 years. They are the most on fire for God. There's something about as we use the gifts God has given us, something comes alive in us. And also, they ultimately get the great rewards. But what's far better about church than about a sports team is that unlike in a sports team, we are all called to participate. You see, in a football match, um, do you know how many players get to play? 22. <laughs> Obviously, subs can come on. Um, but 22 people get to play, and sometimes tens of thousands, and if it's on, on, you know, on telly as well, even millions of people get to watch. Church is not like that. In church, in community, in the Christian family, all of us get to play. Hallelujah. We don't get called to participate or to spectate. We are all called to participate. Now, the great news is that, you know, for over three decades now, Karen and I have had the privilege of being involved in a church community, in the family of God, where there's been a huge culture of participation and serving. And many of you that I'm speaking uh, today to, you know, have been part of that, serving with such joy and excellence and faithfulness. But I'm sure we'd all agree, the pandemic, through no fault of our own, has in many cases disrupted those serving patterns. It's like there's been a major pause button pushed on our serving. Now, of course, that doesn't mean there hasn't been serving going on over these last 15 months. We've just heard, haven't we, wonderful stories of how life groups have been serving each other. We've had an amazing serving of those in need in our various cities too. And I believe this group dynamic, this meals, eating together, serving one another uh, that we've just heard is so important. We're going to really be majoring on that uh, sense of eating together and celebrating together um, over the summer months. But for today's purposes, I want to home in on um, what um, in Acts was like their larger context, the temple courts gatherings, which for us here is, of course, our weekend services. Now, the good news is that there's already um, a revival of participation beginning again. I heard a great story of one woman. Um, she started joining with our online services at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, she went on an alpha course, got involved in a group. That group became a well-being group. And she was online in these various uh, spheres for um, well over a year. But she was desperate to meet the family that she had connected with. Her life was being transformed. And so on Easter Sunday, she was here in person. And then two weeks later, we see her. She's already serving on a team. She just wants to bless the people who've blessed her. She wants to welcome the people who've welcomed her. She wants to get involved in seeing other people's lives transformed. Many of those who are serving again are long-standing Kingsgate members. Uh, Karen and I came in the car park today and we saw Farmer Tom. For those who know Farmer Tom, uh, he's, he's an extrovert. He loves people. He's a great life group leader. If, if I was feeling miserable, no longer. <laughs> Tom, is, he's using the gifts God's given him to, to, to serve. You know, I can think of... Um, a uh, couple of our grand adults who uh, just recently heard, you know, they, they've started serving the, the kids' teams. And in their words, they're just really feeling part of it again. There's something about that connection between serving and belonging. Or I can think of one young woman who, uh, again, I, I saw t today, um, she's involved in l loads of serving through small groups. But because she's got young children, she's had a baby during lockdown, she's not been able to serve in person as much as she would like. And so she's recently started serving as part of our online services team. Here's the point. Um, unlike in sport, unlike in any kind of, uh, you know, be it tennis, football, rugby, whatever, where there's only a few people get to play, we all get to play. We are all called to participate. We have the privilege of all being involved. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that we all have a 
unique part to play. You know, back to sports teams, a winning team normally has different players with different skills playing in different posi uh, positions. Now, if we want a, a team to be successful, all members of the team have to know their role and play their part. Now, if in an occasion one key player gets injured, or maybe plays out of position, or gets lazy and doesn't perform, or in Man City's case, in the debacle of last weekend, a key player gets left out, the end result is that the team won't perform as well and will often lose. So it is with church community. Can I say, you are unique. You have unique skills. You have unique gifts. You have a unique temperament. You have unique uh, abilities. You have a unique um, opportunity to serve God. And your uniqueness, working together with other uniquely gifted people, helps make the church the beautiful bride of Christ that Jesus has designed her to be. Amen? There's something about our uniqueness, our diversity working together, as we heard a couple of weeks ago, in unity. Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter puts it this way um, in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, each of you should use whatever gift, or I would say all gifts, whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. Let me ask you a question. How do you and I find our unique place? Well, firstly, maybe it's a time to reflect Maybe you were involved in serving and um, the pause button's on, but it's a time to reflect again. What is it that makes you, you? Have a think about your gifts, natural talent, spiritual gifts. Think about your personality. Think about what you're passionate about. Think about what you care about. And then can I say there's no substitute to, fight, to just getting involved. You see, the more we get involved... Uh, the more we actually experiment with the gifts and the talents God's given us and we can trust that God and other people will help steer us into the right place in the body. And there's something that happens when we use the gifts that God's given us. I heard a, a great story just again recently. I can think of one of our long-standing gifted pastoral people in the church, been part of Kingsgate for decades, uh, you know, he's a very encouraging, warm kind of person that hasn't been able to serve in this season in person like he, would, uh, like he would have liked. And so, again, he's offered to play part on the online services welcome team. See, something happens when we use the gifts that God has given us. So here's the encouragement. Whether you're new to Kingsgate, you've been here for months, years or decades... Whether you are near to one of our in-person locations and you're gonna, you've either returned or you're going to beginning to return really soon, or whether you live far afield, there is a place on the team for every single one of you. There really is. There's a place where you can use what God has given you. And as you do, just like in sport, it's the people who play on the pitch, not spectate, who get most involved, they experience something different, a deeper sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. I believe when we serve God, I can speak personally, sometimes serving is hard, sometimes it's costly, but there's the inner joy and thrill of knowing that I'm serving the Jesus who came to serve and save me. Amen. I'm involved in helping transform people's lives now and for eternity. There's, if you like, an internal reward we experience. But let me just take the long view. You see, a great sports team will receive an earthly medal. We receive an eternal reward. And can I tell you, for every act of service we've done in serving God's people in and through the lo local church, there is a glorious eternal reward waiting. There's going to come a time. I don't know whether you're looking forward to that time. I am when hopefully I'm going to hear the words of Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. You used the gifts, the talents. You kept going. You didn't quit. You didn't back down. You pressed through every obstacle, every season, and you kept on going forward. 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You're looking forward to the Lord commending you? There's a glorious eternal reward for faithful servants. And if we're going to experience a revival of community, both belonging and participating, it's going to take every one of us to be involved. I love the words of Rachel Hickson in her I Love Prayer book. She's talking about prayer, but it applies wider. Say, today, God is looking for an ordinary people who will do extraordinary things. This is not a time for us to stand back and feel that only the spiritual superstars can take the lead. It's a time for each of us to arise and to take our responsibility. And so I'd like us all to respond together. Whether you're watching online or you're here gathered in, in the room, this is an opportunity for us just to pause why don't we just take a moment quietly in our hearts, even as I'm speaking, why don't you just thank God that being a Christian and becoming Christian isn't just about having a relationship with Father God, you have the privilege of being welcomed into the family of God. In fact, I want to start right there and then because there may be people who are, who are joining today and you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you have been spectating and can I say if you're not a Christian that's absolutely fine if we look back in the early church the only spectators in Acts were the people outside they were looking in at the love that these people had for each other and then they start giving their lives to Jesus and you may be here today maybe you've been watching for a while maybe like that woman I just shared about you've been joining with us sometime during the pandemic maybe you're back or your first time in church. I want to give you an opportunity to belong to the greatest family on planet Earth. It's not perfect. Filled with people who are being transformed. So right now in the quiet of your heart, you might just want to say, I welcome you in, Lord Jesus. Forgive me for my sin. I receive your forgiveness. I worship you, Jesus, as the risen Lord. I make a choice to come into the family of God. For many others of us, we're already Christians. We're already a part of the family. Maybe it's been very recent for you. Maybe you've been here for decades. This is an opportunity for you to say, I don't want to just be swept away by this increasing tide of individualism. I want to be a true follower of Jesus who, who live with his disciples in community and then set up a vibrant community. I want to be part of that. I want to be proactive in that. I know many of us already are, but if you're not yet part of a life group, or maybe you want to start with a connect group, one of the, sort of the action steps you may need to take is just join up a group as soon as possible. Or you're already part of a group. And I believe this, this sense of revival and what Gally was talking about, meals together and something about the time and the space. It's a fresh commitment within all the, you know, the, the safety thing that we're aware of right now. But we do have the opportunity to re-engage again in a deeper way. Why not make that a choice? Think about who you can invite around. Think about who you can encourage in this season. And then for all of us, this is an opportunity to just re-surrender our lives and thank God that he's made us unique. Why don't you just think about your life right now? Think about what you're good at. Think about what you love doing. Peter talked about each of us receiving gifts. It's a thing of grace. And us being faithful stewards. So wherever you are right now, why don't you just lift out your hands? Just take a moment and say, thank you, Lord that you've made me unique. You've called me to be involved. And whether I'm new here or there's been a pause button on my participation, right now, Lord, I resurrender my life and ask you to speak to me. And then, Lord, I want to be a faithful steward. 
I don't want to spectate, Lord. I want to be involved. And then it says, those who speak should speak the very words of God. Peter goes on to say, and then he says, those who serve should serve with the strength that God supplies. Some of you, even just the thought of <clears throat> serving, maybe again, it's like this year has been just exhausting for you. But that's where we don't do this alone. There's a strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. The very God who gave us the gifts anoints us. And so with your hands right now, why don't and we, we're going to get ready to sing again. It's been like a theme song for this whole series, Fresh Wind. Why don't you, as it were, open your life again. Imagine like you're a sail on the ship to to use that analogy. Say, Lord, I want to lift up my sail. I want to get involved. I want to connect relationally again. I want to start serving again, but I want to lift up my sail. I want to hoist my sail. And I ask, Lord, for the prevailing wind of your spirit. In fact, I pray for everybody watching right now as we get ready to sing, Lord, that your strength would come. I pray for those who are feeling weary, weak and discouraged. Pray for those who can't even see a way through of getting involved, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that you would enable them and bless them and guide them and strengthen them. And together, Lord, we want to lift up our sails and pray for a revival of community in Jesus' name. May the church come alive into this new season. May we see many more people's lives transformed as we move ahead in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's just thank God for what He's doing and what He's going to do. And why don't we now, whether we're at home or here together, let's worship the Lord. Let's make this our song. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come.